Taylor's chapter on rotating reference frames is not actually what this is about, even though something's rotating. So on the exam, in problem three, we had this uh, construction here. It was this uh, object that uh, uh, mostly symmetric, except, the, uh, you know, so four spokes with balls at the end, right? Um, if uh, that thing wasn't bent, then um, it would be a nice symmetric thing. If it rotates around the z-axis, the omega that's shown there, it would be uh, rotating around a principal axis. But the fact that one of those spokes is bent means it's not symmetric, and it's not quite rotating around the principal axis. And so in the question, you figured out what is the moment of inertia tensor for this thing. And many of you did it right, figured out that, in fact, there are some off-axis terms, the um, xz term was not zero in this case. Um, I think both the yz and zy were zero at t equals zero, but when this thing starts rotating, of course, it changes with time. So because there's off-axis elements along the moment of inertia tensor, which you calculated around the origin, which is at the center of the vertical rod here, that means that um, we are not, the axes we're calculating the tensor in are not the principal axes. And so once you have that tensor and you know the omega is entirely in the z direction, um, you could figure out the direction of the angular momentum. And many of you, most of you, figured out correctly that yes, the angular momentum does have a negative x component. Um, now for the angle that I picked here, it's, um, and for the omega, so this angle here, what is this angle? It's something like 25 degrees. Um, the omega was 25 seconds to the minus 1. This is the one I gave you in the problem. So in this case, you know, L is still mostly in the Z direction, but it has a negative X component. And then, of course, if you actually, that's just at one instant in time when the thing is oriented like this, but really it's rotating. So, of course, L moves around in a circle. Well, the tip of L moves around in a circle as a function of time, like that. And so that means there must be a DL DT. Now, this is where I know a bunch of you, because you asked me questions while you were doing the test, started thinking about, oh my goodness, so I have to figure this out by doing stuff in the rotating reference frame. You didn't need to. Um, and, and by the end, nobody did it that way. Um, you have an expression for L. It's actually not that bad an expression. Yes, coming up with the moment of inertia tensor um, as a function of phi, when phi is the angle around the z-axis that's rotated, that was kind of long. Um, but most of you were able to do it without too much trouble. I mean, a few of you messed up your trigs a little bit, whatever. But many of you got that one right. So you could do it. And then you just dot that matrix with um, 0, 0, omega, the omega vector, and you get the angular momentum as a function of phi. And it has all of x, y, and z components. Just take a derivative of that, knowing that if omega is the rate the thing is rotating around the z-axis, and if phi is the angle around the z-axis, then phi dot has to be omega. Right? That's just what they are. And so you get that. And now that you have that derivative, you have DLDT. You didn't have to do anything in the accelerated reference frame. Right? So there's that DLDT, which I've drawn both up there at the top as the vector that is uh, the, the difference vector, little differential difference vector for L. That's also the torque, right? The torque is DLDT. And I've drawn the torque down at the um, origin, which is what we've been calculating stuff around. So then the final question, and this is where many of you started to have all kinds of trouble, was what is the force that gives rise to this torque? And most of you got very distracted uh, by the fact that um, there were rods that will have tension in them and balls, and none of that was relevant in this case. Remember, in the context of talking about the moment of inertia tensor, we were talking about rigid body rotation. What does rigid body rotation mean? The parts don't move relative to each other. So if instead of rods I had springs, the analysis we did was too simple. Right? We made the assumption it was a rigid body when we did all of this moment of inertia tensor stuff. And what that means is any internal forces, the tensions on the rod, the um, the torque on one of the rods, the torque of, uh, or the, the whatever, all of the things pulling on the rods, pulling on the balls with each other, none of those are relevant because all of those will be what they need to be to keep the thing rigid. None of those are external to the object. The DLDT you calculated was that L, in fact, the L you calculated was the angular momentum of the entire object. 
So that DLDT, which is this rigid object, as it rotates, it has that DLDT. There must be a torque external to the object that is supplying that torque, and that's the key. Now, so think about it. If there were no external torque, you know what would happen. If there were no external torque, L would be conserved, and so the object would process itself, right? Because omega is at an angle to L, and so if L was conserved as it rotated, omega would have to rotate relative to L, and we saw a lot of those. We did a lot of those objects. In this case, it's not processing, so there is a torque keeping it from processing. That torque has to be exactly equal to DL dt. Now, the next thing, a bunch of you thought, oh, well, maybe it's gravity. Well, no. Now, gravity actually would exert a little torque in this case, but you could work out that torque without thinking about the individual masses. Just figure out where is the center of mass of this object. The center of mass is going to be offset a little bit, just a little bit though, well, for, for smallish theta. It's just going to be offset a little bit in the direction away from the bent rod, right? Because the bent rod, that, um, that ball is a little bit closer to the axis. And so the center of mass will be offset a little bit, a little bit in the opposite direction and a little bit up, um, right? It'll be offset... Uh, a quarter the sine of the angle up, right? Because there's three right on the xy plane and one a little bit up. And it'll be offset um, like half of the cosine, half of one minus the cosine in the opposite direction because there's two along the center plane. There's one balancing and the one that's a little closer in. That'll be offset. You could do the r cross f for that torque for that gravity if gravity is down, which actually isn't necessarily true. You would get a torque. It would not be enough to supply the um to keep this thing still and you know how do we know that well we've done this before we've actually done stuff under gravity and you see that it still processes under gravity and this thing is not processing gravity can't do it and in fact those of you who asked me about this i said ignore gravity this thing should still be able to help still even if it's in free fall where is the force that's giving rise to the torque it's got to be something external to the object well you have to read the problem and right at the beginning of the problem i tell you um, there's a central rod, and it's got frictionless bearings at either end, and those frictionless bearings are affixed in place, affixed in place. That's the key. What does affixed in place mean? It means they don't move. What that means is if things push around on them, there's got to be other forces holding them in place. There's external forces holding the bearings in place. And so if your system is the rod plus the spokes plus the four balls, then the bearings are the external force. If you include the bearings in your system, then whatever is holding the bearings in place is the external force. So the external force is going to be at the bearings. Next, because they're frictionless bearings, remember, along a plane of contact, right? if it's frictionless, there's no force along the plane. The force has to be perpendicular to the plane. So since these bearings, well, there's no force in the tangential direction, or given that the way I drew these bearings, they're cylinders, right? Uniform, they're, they're not tilting in or out in Z. There's no force in the Z direction because that would be parallel to the plane. The only force has to be in the radial direction. So that is going to be perpendicular to the displacement from the center of the object, or really the origin, which isn't the center of mass of the object, from the origin um, to the bearing. And that displacement, well, the distance was not H, it was H over 2. And a bunch of you, not a bunch of you, some of you used H instead of H over 2 for the distance. All right, it's H over 2 is the distance because H is the length of the rod. Um, and the force has got to be perpendicular to that H, right? It, not exactly because the center thing actually has some thickness, but if we ignore the thickness of the center axle, um, that force is going to be perpendicular. And if you use your right-hand rule, this is the direction that the force has to be. There'll be one both on the top and the bottom, and that's another thing a bunch of you missed, is that the force on each bearing is only half of the total force because both of them can supply all of it. Right, both of them together can supply all of it, right? And how do I know that the force is exactly balanced between the two? Because if it wasn't, um, the whole thing would be moving, accelerating off to one side or the other side, right? So those those two forces there use the right hand rule. They will give you the, the torque that's in the right direction. Those are the forces that's holding this thing so that it has a constant omega and allowing the angular momentum to change. Now, there is one thing, I mentioned this in the Discord that we left out. Because the center of mass is not along the axis of rotation, the center of mass is orbiting around the center. There has to be a centrifugal force holding it into the center. So um, really, the net force um, on the central thing won't actually entirely balance out. There would be an additional thing that we would calculate um, that would uh, offset 
the forces of those other two things, but I just asked you, what's the force that's giving rise to the torque? And so that's what's shown here. The force that's giving rise to the torque is at the bearings. And so if you think about what this means, this means that we have, they're just four kilograms, well, one kilogram each, and what's a kilogram is, I don't know, two or three pounds, I don't remember, something like that, um, rotating around at um, 25 uh, omegas, 25 seconds to the minus one. And what did I say that was? It's um, so two pi over omega is the period. So that gives you a period of something like um, one fourth of a second, if I did that right. So it's about four rotations per second, right? So it's rotating reasonably fast, but not helicopter speed, right? Um, and then this central thing is bent. And at the angle I gave you, it's um, you end up with something like 60 pounds of force at the top and the bottom. Right. So this is why if you have asymmetric rotators and you're trying to hold them still, um, they uh, you can actually you need to exert a fair amount of force and you can do this. Go ahead and get a bicycle wheel. We have one in the lab. Next time we're in lab, if we're ever allowed to go back to campus, clip something on the end, get a really firm clip and clip something on the edge of one of these things and rotate the thing and try and hold it still. And you'll feel the force pulling back and forth on your hands. Um, and right, this is why I'm scared of helicopters, because if your blades get asymmetric, one of your blades gets bent a little or something like that, um, there's going to be all sorts of um, torques at the center trying to hold it still. And if the helicopter is not built strongly enough to hold it together, the whole thing's going to fly apart um, and people get killed when that happens. And that's bad. Anyway. Um, I just wanted to say this mostly because so many of you were struggling about find, figuring out where the force was. And the key was rigid body. It's got to be external to the object and affixed bearings. That means they're nailed in place. That means there's external forces there. That's where your external forces are. All right. It's been a good semester. I've enjoyed teaching mechanics. I will see most of you next year, either in astrophysics or modern or maybe I don't think I'll have anyone in both. I'll have everyone in one or the other. No, maybe I will have a bunch of you in both. I don't even know. See ya.